He predestinated us unto the what? Adoption. That's one of the spiritual blessings. That's one of the blessed spiritual blessings from the result of salvation. It's called adoption. Man, give me one of these spiritual blessings. I'll create a sermon out of all 50 of them or something. Bless God, man. Adoption, man. Adoption is such a wonderful thing. Why? Because um, the law, uh, are you married to Jesus Christ? Yes, right? We are married to Jesus Christ. Marriage is such a powerful bond that God says uh, that God says that let no man put asunder what God hath joined together. That's how powerful marriage is. But here's the thing over here is that didn't you know that the laws of adoption are stronger than the Come laws on. of marriage? Come on. The laws of marriage you can divorce and actually God did divorce Israel. Yeah. That's what you're going to find out in the Bible. Yeah. But the laws of adoption that that is strong. Yeah. That is something that cannot be broken over there. The laws of adoption. It's much stronger than the laws of marriage. So uh, I'm glad that I'm adopted. Amen. I'm not just a uh, the reason why it's an adoption is because we were Gentiles. See? Yeah. So because we're Gentiles, the Lord, He chose the nation of Israel as His natural people. But then these foreigners, strangers like us, came in, and God says that I, choose, that I adopt them. Why is adoption better? Because if you uh, gave birth to a son, and you don't like that son, you don't like that daughter, the poor, unfortunate child, you know, you might say, ah, but you're still my son, you're still my daughter. You know why? Because they're born from you. But adoption, you chose. Yeah. The child that you like so he don't hate you he loves you oh I sin so much well he chose you before the foundation of the world all right let's go back all righty let's look at verse 5 see I, that can become a great sermon right I could go probably 45 minutes just on adoption and I don't think anyone here would give a complaint on that one <laughs> all right let's keep reading verse 5 adoption of children so we be uh, the, the predestination is made where he adopted us as his children by Jesus Christ so Jesus Christ everything was made possible Jesus Christ did this yeah. to himself that's why we're able to go to God the Father to become His adopted children. Now, look at this. According to the good pleasure of His will. So this is according to, uh, to His pleasure. And His pleasure is always good. And that's His will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace. It's done to give praise to Him because His grace is that glorious his grace is so glorious that that is he is praiseworthy so look at revelation chapter 4 revelation chapter 4 so what are you created for so some people like these lovey-dovey churches rick warren you know they give these creepy passages that you know, God loves you because he made you. And every time you are sleeping at night, he's looking down on you with loving eyes. And no, that's a creep. That's a creep right there, you know. So, so see, wh what happens is uh, Rick Warren, because he's so used to being so lovey gushy, he's trying to build up that lovey gushiness. That becomes something where this is disturbing, see. So you, to be fair with Rick Warren, see, it's not being nitpicky about his, the way he writes. It's because that's what happens when you try to build up the gushiness so much. And when you build it up so much, it becomes something that's very creepy, okay? But the thing is this, is that it's not because of that that you were created. You know why you were created? It's for his good pleasure, you got to understand. So the greatest thing in your life, the problem with independent fundamental Baptists is that they think that the greatest thing in life is soul winning, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. Now winning souls is important, but that's not the most important thing. You were fearfully, wonderfully made. Everything was created. Why? Because look at Revelation chapter 4. This is something that people do not know. Verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory. Remember Ephesians chapter 1? It's to... 
the praise of the glory of His grace. So they're praising Him at verse 11. That matches with Ephesians 1. Let's keep reading. And honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. That's important. Okay? It's for His pleasure. That's the most important thing in your life is to do it for His pleasure. You live for His pleasure. That's important. When you got saved, it's not a license for you to sin to do whatever you want. When you got saved, you are according now to, you are to live for Him that is done for His pleasure according to His will. That is very important. A lot of people think that my life is mine. No, it's not yours. It belongs to God. Amen, brother belongs to God. So, how are you living? Are you living according to His pleasure? That's a sermon right there. Everything you live and breathe in your Christian life. We rejoice at verse 3, 4, and 5. We rejoice about that. You know, I'm adopted, and then God uh, predestinated, and He chose me long before the foundation of the world that based on love, I'm without sin, no matter how I live. But because of all of that, you got to realize that all of that is done so that you can live according to His good pleasure, verse 5 and 6. So are you living according to His good pleasure? You should, because He gave you so much. You should at least give something to Him. All right, so uh, verse 6 is a great example of His grace, right? Because His grace is so glorious with these spiritual blessings, that's why we are to live according to the good pleasure of His will and to praise Him for his, the glory of that grace. Last part of verse 6, and then go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Notice, wherein He hath made us accepted in the what? Beloved. Beloved. All right, notice He made you. He made you accepted in the beloved. Ah, now this is very powerful verse on eternal security. And an eternal security that's even stronger than the Calvinist, actually. Stronger than Paul Washer. Because these people think that, they think that in your life, if you did not repent and surrender all to the Lord Jesus Christ and every sin in the book, then you're not genuinely saved. No, I'm going to show you a passage that there are people who actually didn't repent of certain sins. And I'm not just talking about little sins. I'm going to talking about major sins over here that didn't repent of these uh, major sins, but they're called the beloved. Now, if you're beloved, that verse says you, you're supposed to be saved, right? Yeah, predestination is in the context of that for crying out loud. Well, why is it that no matter how many times I sin, I'm in the beloved? It doesn't make sense. They didn't read the context. Remember verse 4? We should be holy without blame before Him based on what? In love. See, that's true love. True love is that you're holy no matter what. You're without blame no matter what. That's His unspeakable love. So the context of beloved at verse 6 is based on love, which is why he blinds himself from seeing your sins. To take away that context, when the Calvinists take away that context, they are misquoting the context of Ephesians 1 about once saved, always saved, no matter how many times you sin. When they deny that doctrine, they're dismantling and ruining the context of Ephesians 1. And all these Calvinists harp about eisegesis, exegesis, context, context, context. Context, eisegesis, exegesis. <laughs> so that's what they do all the stinking time. It makes you so annoyed. So then you play their own playground, their own games, and show them that, so you're not following the context properly. Mm -hmm. Come on. That's what beloved is. What else is it? Right. You're following the context here. But let's look at Scripture with Scripture to back it up now. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 19. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you, we speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, who? Beloved. beloved, for your edifying. What did the beloved do? For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as he would not, lest there be, look at this, debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. This gets worse, trust me, okay? Look at verse 21. 
unless when I come again my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have what? Sinned already. I thought they repented of their sins and repent of all sins. No. Have sinned already and what? Have not repented. It gets worse. Have not repented of the what? Uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness. That mean, that's really wicked sexual sins, you've got to understand. That's really, that's really messed up. But God considers them as what? Beloved. The problem with onlineers is they cannot grasp that, that. So I want to explain this. They think that, man, you're just saying that they can sin whatever they want and they can still get saved. So here's the problem number one, okay? Problem number one, we're not saying that some kind of child molester out there can simply say, oh, I believe Jesus died, buried, and resurrected, so woohoo, I can keep doing what I want to do. No, we believe that there should be repentance in the manner of what? As a lost sinner. And if you repent as a lost sinner for your salvation, there's nothing you can do about it. That's why there's nothing you can do but put your trust in Jesus Christ to get rid of the sins for you. You can't get rid of the sins yourself. These Calvinists put the pressure on people thinking that there's something that they have to be doing themselves to repent of their sinful condition. No, you can't. When you repent as a sinner, you put your faith in Jesus Christ to take care of your sin, your sinful state, and He washes away with His holy blood. All right? So we're not denying that one. However, the problem with a lot of these people is this. A lot of these people think that after you repented as a lost sinner, putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that it's impossible after that for this saved believer to become worse in his sins or remain as a wicked sinner or capable of committing really atrocious sins. That is untrue. You might say, why? Because when the Lord Jesus Christ died to save you from your sins, he was not referring to this flesh. This is their problem over here. All right? The flesh is still sinful. Shocking. It never changed. Sorry. It remains a wicked sinner. Sorry. And it's not like when you receive Jesus Christ, hoping to get victory over your drugs, that automatically your body detoxifies itself and it's eliminated. The flesh never changes. What changes the Holy Spirit in there? See that? That's why we believe in repentance, because there is a change, but it's only in the spiritual realm over here. See that? The Holy Spirit, it feels grief. It gets convicted. The Lord's going to show you something over there. But the thing is, this flesh never changed. So is this flesh capable of resisting the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit convicts you? Yes! Can you drown it out even more and let your flesh grow even more than the Holy Spirit? Yes. Are you capable of committing homosexuality and even murder? Yes. If you don't think that, and you think that because I'm saved, I'm not capable of committing the worst sins, you better watch out. Don't tempt that devil, man. That devil will say, oh, let me play with you. Some people find it hard to believe. How can a person, a saved believer, commit really wicked sins, remain that way, and die that way? You know what, what you don't understand? You don't understand the spiritual walk of spirit versus flesh. When you skip your Bible reading once, yeah, I'm preaching here. When you skip your Bible reading once and prayer once, what happens? The flesh gets used to it. The Holy Spirit convicts you really badly. But then when you do it at day number two and you do it for two weeks, the Holy Spirit conviction is not as strong and doesn't, it doesn't grieve you as much as before. And the flesh just overwhelms you a little bit more. Yeah. Then I guarantee you when you get, don't, don't come to church after that, and then this turns out to six months, those sins and those worldliness that you got convicted over, now you're wondering what's really wrong about that. That's exactly right. Yeah. Some of you are still doing that. I don't know if I'm preaching, okay? But see, some of you are going like, ah. And like, well, really? And then you try to use scripture to justify your sins. And then pretty soon you're going to go to a wishy-washy church. And you don't care if Rick Warren creeps you out in his sermon as long as he retains your sins in his church. That's your problem, right? You'd rather hang around with a creepy guy just so that you can keep your sin. That's your problem, man. So then, you don't care if the person creeps you out and then you just stay over there. Why? Because so that you can keep your sin 
and I guarantee you that this little sin will just grow even a bigger one to a bigger one to a bigger one and don't be surprised later on that we'll see you maybe become an atheist or a homosexual one day so I think you should take the Christian walk seriously we take our Christian walk seriously more than the Calvinist why because Christian walk we realize we're capable of messing up so I gotta watch every step that I make Calvinists are just back to the past thinking about like salvation. I'm genuinely saved. I'm genuinely saved. Yes, I am really saved. And that becomes pharisaical that they think that I will never commit such really atrocious sin in the future. How about that? You want me to give you the greatest evidence against these Calvinists? Cal John Calvin committed murder. He burned somebody at the stake. The founder of Calvinism. All right. Now you go home and pray about that, you Calvinists. <laughs>